hope you, uh, it's nice to have really a, quite a full house here. And I, anyone, i give my greetings to anyone who may be listening online as well. I hope you are having a very restful and a peaceful Sabbath today. Well, I'd like to start out with a couple of statements. And for those of you keeping, keeping score at home, if you want to jot down your thoughts, uh, simple yes or no to see how you feel about these first four statements I want to run past you. First one is, you are a certain kind of person. Not much can be done to really change it. Yes or no? Second statement, no matter what kind of person you are, you can always change substantially. Statement number three, you can do things differently, but the important parts of who you are can't really be changed. And the last one, you can always change basic things about the kind of person you are. Right? We're not going to pass those to the left and have the ushers collect them. That's for your own edification to review. But think about those. Further think about this question. Are you the kind of person who likes a lot of praise or a lot of, lots of challenge? Just jot that one down as well. And here's the real clincher one when you start thinking about a spouse, a husband or a wife, right? When you think about that, would your ideal mate, when you think about your mate, would your ideal mate be someone who puts you on a pedestal, makes you feel perfect, worships you? I don't want to reveal my answer, but I think I checked that box. All right. <laughs> second one, second option for those of you who don't think that's a good option. Uh, your ideal mate would see your faults, help you to work on them, challenge you to become a better person, and encourage you to learn new things. Those statements, questions, thoughts, ideas come from a book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. It was a book that I was, before I started my employment, I was asked to read the book and I found it to be quite enlightening, very enlightening. And I sat down as I was looking through it, and it was raising some interesting thoughts about who I thought I was and who I had to somewhat come to the reality of who I was in certain areas of my life. Her basic premise in the book is that most people are going to fall. Now, there's a, there's a continuum on here, and sometimes you'll find in certain areas we're certain ways, in other areas we're a little different. But she proposes the basic thought that we're either a, of a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. Fixed mindset or a gross mindset. And her definition of a fixed mindset is that you really feel that your qualities, who you are, they're pretty much carved in stone. They're set in stone. It's who you are. You're defined sort of by sort of how you came out. You're given these set qualities, these characteristics, these abilities, and you have a set amount of ability. It's predefined, sort of how you're hardwired. It's who you are as a person. And if you have a fixed mindset, there's things that go along with that mindset. There's always a certain urgency for you to prove yourself over and over again. Because if you only have a certain ability or you see yourself a certain way, you want to make sure that that's known that, you know what, you can do certain things and you want to prove that time and time again. You want to rehearse that with people. In every situation that you are in front, you're confronted with, is either it's a confirmation of your intelligence, your personality, and your character. Each situation you come into face with confirms that. It's very important that that's understood and people understand that. And because you have, you perceive that you have a certain limited or set amount of ability and room to change, every situation you come up, and we'll look at this, how the fixed mindset works, Every situation is very, very critical to that person. She goes on to say that a growth mindset, a person with that kind of a mindset, you know, you realize that you've been dealt a hand in life, but that's as a starting point. It's a starting point. And you can cultivate your basic qualities through effort, strategies, and help from others. So that everyone can change through experience and with some help and encouragement. Now, I thought it was interesting as I read through this, this talks about a number of different things from parenting to business to school to relationships, right? All different types of mindsets. And I was reading through it 
And I think it's a good time of the year for this type of sermon. As we flip the calendar, sometimes we do assessment and we get into the spring holidays. It's a time, again, when I was sitting down and thinking about this book on a very physical level, right? What kind of person am I in terms of as a parent when you have either a fixed or a growth mindset? When it comes to relationships with a spouse and wondering why she doesn't still worship me, right? Those kind of things that made me stop and I was... It's supposed to be a humorous thing, folks, because I don't, if anyone's still in that spot after 31 years of complete, and you know, unadulterated worship, come see me because I want to know what you're doing, right? But no, but um, no, across a number of things, when you're a student in school, a fixed mindset, it, 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 it reacts in very different and certain ways. So this was a very telling book, and I had to put it down from time to time and reassess and said, boy, this is some tough, these are, these are tough things to come to grips with when I started to look on that spectrum. And what I want to say this afternoon, she goes on at least to make all of us feel a little better, is that you're usually not one or the other, right? On the spectrum, on certain things, you can be fixed, but then you might be open to growth over here. There's things you might say, you know what? I can see how I could change, but over here, this, boy, this is really, really difficult because this is where I find so much of my identity. This is where I find my value. This is where it's important to me to be a certain way and for people to think of me like this. And that's a very, very important thing. And I protect that world. That's why I say every interaction, everything that comes up, if I'm in a fixed mindset in that area, I work really, really hard to protect that image that I want people to see because that's where my value comes from. So very, very important in this book. But then I thought extremely important as we look at it in this book. Right? As we look at it and ask the question this afternoon in the time that I have remaining, the question that I ask myself, the question I ask you, am I a fixed mindset Christian or am I a, am I a growth mindset Christian? Very, very important. Super important with people and relationships and understanding ourselves and how we act and we say, boy, I'm in a fixed spot over here. Can I get better? Can I change my thought process? What am I protecting? What am, I, what, am, what am I afraid of? What is, you know, it's an interesting thing. But boy, when we get here, when we get into the spiritual side of things, that's where it's really important. When I was starting to think about the transformation from going from this book to this book, I mean, there's so many things we could explore in God's word, and we will this afternoon, but the very painfully obvious one was, you know, the parable of the talents. All right, what the king who went away and gave his servants either one or five or ten talents and some of them, two of them, did something. They grew, right? They did something. They changed. If you read the story about the one who had the one talent, he didn't change. He didn't grow. He defended why he didn't do anything, right? He preserved that. And we look at that and we say, you know, we are called, first and foremost, as Christians, to grow. Right? I don't think any of us would hear, and if you're jotting that down in your notes, you said, boy, that's just, I cannot believe he's making that statement. I'm not going to argue with that statement as I'm taking notes, right? Yeah, we are here to grow and to change as Christians, right? I think that's 101, and we would all sign up for that. We are here to grow and to be changed into, as it says in Romans, right? We can go all through the Bible and talk about growth, to be transformed, right? To put off the old man and put on the new man. Right? How many years we talk and we look at that and we say, yes, that's where I want to be. Right? That's what I want to be doing. You know, in Matthew 5, it says, become you perfect. Become mature. Become complete. Become the kind of person that God intended from the start that we're going to start here. And to become mature and complete, he wants us to end over here. That we'd all sign up and say, yeah, that's exactly what I think I am. Right? I think I am a growth-minded Christian. Right? I think we would all think that way. I thought I was a growth-minded person until I started reading this. Right? So this afternoon, I want to walk through and do a simple assessment for all of us. Three, three areas that she brings out in the book here about assessing us on this continuum of where am I? in terms of being a fixed or a growth-minded Christian. And I want to say at the outset, I hope you find this encouraging, because no matter where we find ourselves in certain areas, we can change. It doesn't have to define us. It doesn't have to be that A, B, or C that we got in seventh grade biology that stays with us and defines us today, right? That's the beautiful thing about 
this process that we're in in a spiritual way that we have a chance to move and change, and that's what we're called to do. So this afternoon, I just want to walk through three areas, three questions, three things for us to consider as we look at ourselves and say, you know, as I sit back on a January day or when I sit back in the intervening days and weeks that are coming up uh, before Passover, where am I? Because I want to grow, right? I think we'd all say that. We all want to, and I know we are, and we're doing those things. But how can we ensure that we are really, in, in as many areas as we can, growing as God would have us grow? So the first question I would propose or throw out for your consideration this afternoon is this. How do you react when challenged? How do you react when challenged? Turn with me to 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13. First Samuel 13, this is a story, just to give you a little background, this is a story where Saul was in a spot and Samuel had told him to wait seven days until he returned before he did anything in terms of sacrificing any livestock, but it was now the seventh day. Samuel had not shown himself. The Philistine army was gathering around. It was a scary and ominous situation. Some of the people were starting to, to, to scatter, right? Put yourself in that situation. Sort of scary like the, like the sermonette topic, right? But things were happening now. What happens in 1 Samuel 13? 1 Samuel 13 and verse 8. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattered from him. They started to lose confidence. They saw the enemy, right? Very afraid for their lives. Verse 9, Saul said, bring the burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. And this is just sort of irony all the time, right? You wait, you wait, you wait. Okay, I'm holding out to the last second. I do what I got to do. And what happens in verse 10? Now what happened, as soon as he had finished doing that, who shows up? Samuel, of course. Of course, right? That's where it's going to, that's how life goes sometimes, right? Samuel shows up. Samuel said to him, what have you done? What have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattered from me, you did not come within the appointed days. And the Philistines were gathered here. And, and I said, the Philistines will now come down upon me. And I haven't made supplication to the Lord. I felt compelled and I offered a burnt offering. You get it, right? Saul, I mean, Samuel, what choice did I have? You, you see the situation around me. You weren't here. It was late. You weren't showing up. That's what I, I pretty much had to do that. You understand where I'm coming from, right? Turn over to Exodus. Exodus 32. Exodus 32 and verse 22. Exodus 32 and verse 22. This is when Moses again had been up to the mountain too long. And the people were saying, we've got to move past him. We've got to do something different. We don't even know if he's coming back, what's happening. So they gathered all their valuables, their gold, they put it together. Moses comes down the hill and he asks in verse 21, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? Now there's some level of comedy I find in the answer, but there's also, again, it shows a certain attitude, a certain spirit when confronted, when challenged with the truth. Aaron said, don't let the anger of my Lord be hot. You know the people. You've been here before, Moses. You've been with these guys a long time, right? You remember who you left behind, this group of people here? You know these people. They are, they, they are set on evil, right? They're just, that's who they are. Remember Moses? And they said to me, let, make us gods that go before us. For this man Moses, the man who brought us out of the land, we don't know what's become of him. You know, they were worried if you were coming back. I, I knew you were, but you know, these guys here, they doubted, right? And so they came to me and said, do something about it. And I said to them, all right, break off gold. Anyone who has it, bring it to me, and I will cast it into the fire. And then it's unbelievable how this turned out. Then this calf just popped out. It's the weirdest thing. I never could have thought it would have worked this way. But here we sit, Moses, you understand everything I'm telling you, right? 
a spiritually fixed mindset will defend itself and protect its image. In both examples here, with Saul and with Aaron, there wasn't a realization, there wasn't a softening of the spirit. There was very much a quick rationalization of what they had done, of what their actions were, because they had a certain image. They wanted to protect who they were. They had to defend the hill, so to speak, and they could not see themselves fully. They did not see the subtleties, did not see the subtleties of their sin. On the flip side, someone who's in a growth mindset, when challenged, when faced with someone who's bringing them something that's uncomfortable, they are open to feedback and will respond appropriately even though it's hard to hear. Even though it's quite difficult, they react in a different way. Let's just stay in the Old Testament here for a minute. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 12. Very different response. When challenged, the response is different. 2 Samuel 12. Again, this is the story of David and Bathsheba. David, who had sinned gravely in this situation, was confronted by Nathan the prophet. 2 Samuel 12. He confronted David with a very interesting story about a rich man and a poor man. The rich man had many flocks and the poor man had nothing but one little lamb. As I read it again just before I came up, it's interesting in verse 3 when he talks about the poor man with that one lamb that he bought it, he nourished it, he grew up with it. And he grew up with him and his children and it ate of its own food and drank of its cup and lay in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. I mean, the bond, the closest that Nathan was setting up with this story. We talked about the rich man who took that lamb to feed a stranger. And David, what was his response? He was angered greatly, and he says, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. Surely die. David was rightfully incensed, very upset. And Nathan says in verse 7 to David, you are that man. Now, don't forget, David was the king, right? He could have responded in any number of ways to defend and justify his position. What does he say in verse 13? Verse 13, David said to Nathan, I am that man. I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. That's what David's response was, that he had sinned. Full stop. He was open to seeing himself and understanding that there was nothing at that point to defend. There was nothing there that needed to be circumvented and justified and, and rationalized. He was able to see himself, and his sin was clearly in front of him. Now, we don't have to go very far. The obvious example when we talk about this difference between a fixed and a growth mindset, let's go to John 8. John 8. John 8 and verse 31. This is Jesus and one of his, I could have picked many different examples with Jesus with the Pharisees. All right, the Pharisees, you would say probably first and foremost were of a people who were of a fixed mindset. They had a certain image. They had a certain way they went about things, they defended that, there was a, they were not open to taking much in, any, in the way of advice, guidance, deviation to what they thought, what they believed, and they were quick to defend that position. John 8 and verse 31, and Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's a statement that's a challenge statement in a way that if you are my disciple, you'll abide in me, abide in my word. Well, what were, how did the Pharisees respond to that? Well, thank you for bringing to that. It's been long overdue. We've been waiting for you, and we're ready to change what we do. Excellent. Thank you very much. No. My Bible says in verse 33, we are Abraham's descendants. 
and have never been in bondage to anyone. Right? This is who we are. We're going to, I am telling you who I am. Right? I am defending my, my world and where I sit. I am not one who needs to change. Right? I have not been in bondage. How can you say you will be made free? And Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever, it doesn't matter where you think you came from, where you're going, whoever sins is a slave of God. The last verse in this, under this section, I just want to turn to, I want to turn to Mark 2 and verse 27. Again, it comes down to an ability an ability to understand ourselves, to see ourselves, and have a willingness, when confronted with the truth, to want to change, to want to walk differently. Mark 2 and verse, Mark 2 and verse 22, I'm sorry. I think I said 27. Mark 2 and verse 22. And Jesus is talking here about the concept of new wine and old wineskins. And he says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. What I'm bringing you is something different. It's not what you think or what you believe. And if you are going to accept it, if you're going to hear me, you have to have a new way of thinking. You have to have a new thought process because if I try to take my words of life and put it in your old mindset, you are going to what? You are going to resist, you're going to push back, you are going to defend, and you are going to stay exactly where you are. That's what Jesus was telling them. The only way this is going to work is if you are going to change the way you think, to accept that you are not the end-all, be-all, ultimate say on what I'm bringing to you. And that's why the Pharisees could not, would not, and were unable to accept and to change from a fixed mindset. And so we sit here and I give you these examples and I say, but you know what the difficulty is? The difficulty is to really understand and see ourselves. Right? Isn't that the crux of the matter? To understand who we are and to see ourselves. Because at that moment in time, and I, I don't mean in any way to besmirch someone like Aaron, but in that moment in time, we can go into a spot, right, that teeters back to more of a fixed mindset. Because I would say Aaron was very much a man of God, a servant of God, right? But it's easy to go into that frame of that, that mindset that starts to quickly rationalize and go into a spot where it's a fixed mindset. So how do we even begin to understand? Because the heart is deceitful. The heart is very difficult to know. And sometimes we're able to live with ourselves because we're able to rationalize and defend. And we are sometimes the best defense lawyers that are out there because we know how to defend and make a story that rationalizes so we feel good, we can live with ourselves. And at the end, we're justified, but we don't realize that we have just defended something that doesn't allow us to grow and to change in the way God wants us to grow. So I will leave you with one point under this section about how can we better see ourselves? How can we better understand our heart? Because I think that is a very, very difficult thing. Go to Hebrews, Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Remember the first time I read this verse, and it's, I feel the same way when I read it now. It's really the antidote to getting to know ourselves and to understand ourselves because what we're talking, when I talk mindset and what comes out as we speak and we communicate, they are really truly issues of the heart, right? That's what has to be changed. That's what has to be understood. And it says here in verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's one of the more sobering, but I think encouraging verses as well. If we take God's word and we pray before we even open it, before we study and say, God, help me see myself. Talk to me through your word. Show me the things that are so far down there that only you know and pull out the things. May your word go straight through me so that I may see, and I may see if there is anything of a prideful nature, of an angry nature, of a nature that is fearful, of a nature that has dot, 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 right? 
that is an unbelievable starting point. If we want to see ourselves, say, God, speak to me in mercy, right? So I can see myself. I can see who I am. And how many times have we been there when you stop and you read and go, that is me, right? As David said, I am that man, right? What a powerful thing for us to begin to see ourselves, understand the subtleties of our human spirit and say, God, pull those things out. May your word go deep. You read that verse. It goes all the way through. May it resonate to my core. So that I don't just read it as it says in James, as a man who looks in a mirror and then walks away and doesn't do anything. Right? That I'm not affected by it, but this would strike me to the core and stop me and help me to self-correct so I can grow and change and move from this spot. Maybe I can move a little further over on this spot here because I, you've shown me something in your word. So that's the beautiful thing, that change. Growth is possible. We don't have to be stuck here, but God can show us that. And I thought as I was reading this book at this point, if I were by myself, I'd stop, take a nap, and call it an afternoon because that's a lot to wrestle with, right? At least for me, when I look at that and I say, when I am confronted with the truth, right? Do I have more of a Saul? And an Aaron response in those instances, or I'm like, David, I am that man, right? Those are tough things. Those are tough. So when I look at that and say, yes, we all want to grow and we're growing, that's a good opening question, right, to think about. Second thing I would offer for your consideration is the question, do you push through the hard stuff? Do you push through the hard stuff? The example she gives in the book here, again, so many great examples so many great examples for young people, like I said, all through different levels. But one of the examples she gave is what you get to the college level, organic chemistry. I've never, anyone ever take organic chemistry? Oh, he's, oh yeah, you figured you might, okay, good. So I asked him about it. I've only heard it, heard about it, and I knew I would never touch it, right? Because it makes and breaks people in certain spots. But she was giving the example that for kids who all along had always gotten A's, they get to organic chemistry and they get a C right? Difficult. And for a lot of those students, they said as soon as they got that, as soon as it wasn't fun, as soon as they didn't feel smart, as soon as their abilities, their intelligence was questioned, they didn't feel smart. Guess what happened? They lost interest, right? They went a different direction, maybe a different major, right? Because it challenged them and they didn't feel smart or it didn't feel like they were where they wanted to be anymore. It was hard for them to push through, push through the hard stuff. Look at Mark 10. Turn to Mark 10, if you will. I had the same experience in eighth grade shop class. We had to make a metal box. It's, some things are just scarred. I'll, I'm just sharing this as I think out. Some things are just scarred in your memory. And you'll never, you'll take them to your grave, I think. We had to make a simple metal box, four, Dean would know, weld, four weld points, you know, like two, I guess eight, two and two and two. And, um, you know, you had to put your box on the table. When they came and saw mine, it looked like, you know, it was like a gunshot, I mean, a gun war had taken place. There were about 12 on each side, overlapping. The box would not sit flat, it sort of wobbled. And I was just waiting for my grade to come. And, they, you know, I think he was merciful, gave me a, he gave me a B. And then he gave me a calculator, you know? And I said, you know, go over here, you know, next line over, right? But it's when you get to those spots, those hard things, those challenges in life, right? Where do we go? How far do we push? And I'm giving you some, some ones just in a, in a human on our uh, physical lives that we experience. But look what, you know, the story in Mark. Mark 10 is the story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He came to Jesus and he did all these things with the commandments. And he said, yep, check that. I do that. I do that. I got it. It's good. It's good. Right? Until Jesus got down to verse 21. And he said, Jesus looked at him. He loved him. I like that little insert, right? He loved him. Because of who he was and what he was doing and his intent and his heart and his desire to be right. He says, one thing you lack. There's only one thing left. Go your way, sell what you have. Give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. Verse 22. 
But he was sad at his word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. It was too hard to push through that one. That one was too difficult. Right? That one wasn't quite worth it, right, to go the extra piece of pushing through and going up the hill and saying, I'll go with you on that. It's worth the climb. He wasn't able to do that. You can just jot down Matthew 13. You know the sower and the seed were seeds were sp spread out and some fell on certain ground and some died out because what? The pleasures or the distractions of things were too difficult. They were too hard. And people walked away. Walked away. And I think about what Jesus said in Luke 14, where he said, he lists all these things, and he says, if you want to be my disciple, right, you have to love less your father, your mother, different relationships. And we go, yeah, 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 and even deny yourself. That's the last one that's listed. We have to give up ourselves, right? So spiritually, sometimes I think it's easy to come to a spot and say, yeah, I'm good in these areas here, but I can't quite give it all over to you because that's where it gets really hard and I'm going to stop here and I'm going to stay here right but if you're pressed me on this one point and we all have maybe our one point and then s is s in parentheses maybe more right where it's difficult and we sort of compartmentalize and leave that there for a little bit but he says here that if you want to follow me you cannot be my disciple unless you give it all up if you take on the whole collective basket of what I'm asking you to do. That's what he talks about here in terms of trying to push through the fixed mindset. We'll say, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go back to where I feel my talents and I'm comfortable over here and I can do well over here and I'll do these things well, but I'm not really going to tackle it all and I'm going to do it that way. Right? Well, Jesus doesn't call us to do that. On the flip side, again, on the growth mindset, the growth mindset will recognize there's challenges, there's difficulties, there's failures, but they don't define them and they strive to overcome those challenges to get better, to get better, right? That's what it is when you think about this whole thing. It's never to a spot where we're like, well, that's, I can see the finish line, it's over, and we, we collapse and we're done. No, it's a process of getting better, getting better. She raises an interesting example in the book here where she talks about a Russian dancer and teacher. And a former student was saying how this lady selected her students that would be in her class. And she said that it all came down to how they reacted to praise or correction. She said those who were more responsive to correction were deemed worthy to be in the class. Those who more wanted to know what they were doing wrong so they could improve. Those who did not recoil from that who were hurt, who were offended, but those who took correction because they knew it would help them to get better and to keep moving up, right? Versus the one who said, tell me how good I am. Tell me how good. Tell me. Keep stuff on where I am right now so I can stay in this spot because it feels good to be right here, right? But we know we're not called to live that way as Christians. We are not called to live in a cozy spot to say, we are done, we are complete, we sit here, and we're going to just stay in this spot, but not really tackle the edges. She gives another example in the book about what she calls the CEO syndrome, where she, some CEOs might surround themselves with people who just say, oh, you know what, you're doing great. No one can say anything against the CEO, right? It's just heap on praise, heap on praise, right? That's a fixed mindset. That doesn't say I want to get better. I just want to hear how good I am now. Right? And she gives the example of one CEO who said, I felt that every day I came in like I was interviewing for the job. Right? That is an entirely different mindset. That every day we say, how can I get better? What do I need to do to keep moving forward? Go to Revelation 3 and verse 21. Revelation 3. Before we go there, let's go to let's go to James. James, Hebrews. I'll give you a fourth book here in a second. Now let's go to let's go to Hebrews twelve.
Hebrews 12 here, Paul writes very much about the whole thing about correction. Because if we are to push through the hard stuff, there are times when we have to be told, you know what, you're not quite doing it the right way. Right? This would be a better way. This is what's happened. He talks about how our parents would have corrected us. But he talks more importantly about how God corrects as well in various ways and forms that that comes. In Hebrews 12, in verse in verse uh, 11. And it says here, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Isn't that the truth? When we are stopped dead in our tracks and we realize that God has a need to correct us. But again, that's it, always with purpose. It is always designed. It's not random. It's not arbitrary. It's not vindictive. Nevertheless, what does it says? It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it, by those who are willing and open and have their minds open to be able to accept that. Those who want to sign up for that program, it ends in a very, very, very good spot, is what it says here. Let's go to Revelation. You don't even have to turn there, but just jot down Revelation 3 and verse 21. It says, to he who does what? To he who is heathed with praises and feels good about himself and is content till I come back and establish my kingdom, will he sit with me? Now it says to he who overcomes. To he who overcomes. And that word overcomes in the Greek means victory. The yoki. That's where you get the word Nike, the company we live with, right? Nike, victory, overcomes. And as I was thinking about this, I think sometimes it's sometimes it's elusive term, I think, even in our Christian walk after many years, sometimes to even think in terms of victory, victory, that something has been overcome, not only obviously with our efforts, but partnering with Jesus and his spirit and God's spirit that helps. And we get back and we say, God, help me to keep walking. I want to win this battle. I don't want to just be beaten back, beaten back, and think, you know what? I can't even touch that one, so I'm just going to sit here and feel good about these things. No, there's victory to be had. To him who overcomes, there's a victory that God wants in the process. With his help, he wants to afford us that. It's a beautiful thing when you think about it that way, that we don't have to be where we are today forever. Right? I say that to the young people. When you think about your lives physically, when you think about the walk and all the things, it doesn't an event, a situation does not need to define you forever. That's, imp that's a very big important thing. She goes in the book and it's amazing things that happen in a first grade situation where a student was put in a certain class. And if they weren't put in that class, they thought, boy, I'm not that smart. Years, years they carried that with them. It doesn't have to be the case. That's a fixed mindset that says, you know what? This is who you always are, right? You can't change. That's your lot in life, right? And even spiritually, it's so important to say, we were called when? When we were sinners, right? When we were sinners. But we are called now to be sons of God, to have glory, right? To move forward. That doesn't always define us. And when we sin, we get back up, we repent, and we move forward. It's a beautiful thing. Let's look what Paul said. Last verse on this point, where Paul talks about how he approached the hard things, how he approached his Christian walk. What did, how did Paul take that? Was he just waiting for accolades to come his way, that you've done these great things, you've done this? And, you know, it's, there's so many verses we can talk and we say, no, those good things, that was your duty to do. Right? Don't look for praise here. Do the things, do the things that God has called us to do. Hebrews 12, or Hebrews 3 and verse 12. Hebrews 3 and verse 12, Paul says, not that I have already attained or already perfected. I don't view myself in this spot where, you know what, I can defend the hill because everything I'm doing is defendable. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ has also laid hold of me. I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward, pressing forward to those things that are ahead. I press. That means I'm really exerting energy and effort toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. 
I like the wording in verse 12 where I say, I lay, I lay hold of that which Jesus Christ has also laid hold of me. I, I think if we think about that, that Jesus has something, Jesus Christ has something in mind for us, that he's laid hold of us. I want you, I want you over here. Come over here with me. Right, that's what Paul's saying. I want to do those things too, that I might grab that as well. Grab that as well. All right, the last question I have, because I think I've, it's about all I can handle, and I've looked at this a few times. So uh, the last question I'll, I'll offer for, your, um, uh, for you to think about or to review is the question of how do we view others? How do we view others? It has a lot to do with our spiritual mindset, whether we have a fixed or a growth mindset. She brings out, I thought, a very interesting example in the book. She talks about going on a fishing trip with her husband. Um, and they went, I think it was, it was fly fishing, and it was very, very difficult uh, to do that. And they were all doing it that afternoon. And she was the only one. Late in the day, she caught a fish. Right? All these men, and this, the author of the book went fishing. And there were two reactions. She said, reaction number one, my husband David came running over, beaming with pride and saying, life with you is so exciting. Okay. Reaction number two, that evening when we came into the dining room for dinner, two men came up to my husband and said, David, how are you coping? <laughs> All right? David looked at them blankly. He had no idea what they were talking about. Of course he didn't. He was the one who thought my catching the fish was exciting, but I knew what they meant. They had expected him to feel diminished, and they were to make it clear that's exactly what my success had done to them. Right? A fixed mindset where you can't celebrate other people. You view them as failures. They view themselves as failures, and they try, they're constantly trying to repair their own self-esteem. Right? And what happens in that situation, you can imagine, blame or excuses begin to follow. I wasn't even trying hard. That, that I wasn't even really trying. My fishing pole wasn't the right size. You know, if I was where she was, I could have caught the fish too. Right? He doesn't want to accept and see oneself for who they are. Doesn't want to understand what's underneath some of these comments where you very readily can accept or assign blame excuses, belittle, and can't celebrate someone else's success. She brought another interesting example, I thought, in the book where they talked about a, a class again with students, and they allowed all the students to see everyone's test score, right? Names, here's the sheet of paper, everyone's name and what they got on the test, right? What do you think students with a fixed mindset did? They compared themselves to those who did worse than them, right? Well, at least I beat so-and-so. I feel okay again now about myself. I didn't, I'm not the last guy on the list here, right? And I protect my world. I'm okay. People with a growth mindset, they looked for the names that did better because they wanted to figure out how do I get better? How do I change? How do I become a better person? Luke 18, Luke 18 and verse 9, you just jot this down for sake of time. Luke 18, verse 9, it's the, ver it's the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector that went to pray. Who had the fixed mindset here? The Pharisee said, so, you know, I, again, I'm going to tell you why I'm so good. I fast X times during the week. I do all these things. God, I am so glad I am not like this person next to me, right? How do we view others, right? I'm glad I'm not like that. And the tax collector who had his head down won't even look up, and he said, I'm a sinner, right? I am here at your throne of mercy and grace. Help me, right? A growth mindset. Forgive me. Stark difference, right? Paul says, and you can jot it down again in 2 Corinthians, 10 and verse 12, he says, you know, we know this verse, comparing yourself one to another is not wise. Right? It's not wise because we're going to do exactly what those kids did on the test score. Well, I'm doing better than those guys, and that's where it stops. 
Well, that's not our bar, is it? What does it say in Ephesians 4.15? That we would all work together and to grow into the unity, into the fullness of the person sitting next to me. No, the fullness of the one who has had Jesus Christ. That is the bar. That is always the gold standard. That's where we look and we say, I have fallen short of the example you have left for me. Right? That's when we are in a growth mindset. We recognize when we're in a growth mindset on the flip side of this coin of how we view others. We recognize we're all at different stages of a process to become like Christ. We're all just merely in different spots in the road. And you can just jot down a couple of verses in this, along this line. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26, when one member of the body suffered, we all suffer. When one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. I think it's one of the beautiful things when you see growth and there's, you see that kind of growth and love in a body like we have, or when you see that, when the whole body rises and falls. That's a growth mindset. That's a growth mindset. Colossians 3 and verse 13. talks about so many good things that we should do as Christians. It says we should all support one another. And my wife, any good thoughts that really come that I'm using up here usually come from my wife. But I'll, I'll give her credit on this one as well when she was saying, when you think about almost a journey going up a mountain, right? You go up a mountain, if we're all going up a mountain together, we would be in different spots on that mountain. Some people might be further up telling us what the weather looks like. Some could be tired on the side. Some could be sliding down a little bit on the mountain. Some might be having to rest at base camp, right? Some might be stopping just to look at the view and say, I want to stay here a little longer. That's all we are. We're all together on a mountain trying to walk up to the same spot to help each other to bear one another's burden, but realizing and recognizing we're all there at different spots. And when we think of it that way, we don't have the reaction here that we can't celebrate, that we don't lock arms. But I think a very, very important concept comes out that we are able to better extend grace to one another, grace to ourselves even, right? And where we find ourselves on that journey, on that mountain as we walk up a hill together, because that's all we're trying to do in this process that we're called. It's a different mindset on how we view others. A person who's in a growth mindset recognizes that and is constantly viewing these people, the people around us, God's children who need help, who need support, who need encouragement, who need forgiveness, as we do, as we do. I want to conclude this, morning, this afternoon just with a quote from the book again. I thought it was interesting. When you think about mindset, it's a very interesting thing. And I think as we think about it from a spiritual, spiritual uh, viewpoint, mindset, it really, really is so much, that, I mean, uh, it's so determined by what really is going on on the inside, what's in our heart. That's why I went to Hebrews 4 and says, what's on the inside will determine so much. That's where the starting point is for the right mindset, is what's inside us. She has a quote here that talks about Billie Jean King, a former tennis player, and she talks about a life, looking back on your life, and she says, you can look back and say, you can look back and say, I've been polishing unused endow um, endowments like trophies, or you can look back and say, I gave, all, I gave my all for the things I valued. Think about what you want to look back and say, and then choose your mindset. Choose which mindset when you want to look back and say, where did I put my energies? Where did I give my effort? Where did I give my all? Because sometimes in a fixed mindset, it's easy to say, oh, I'm not going to try too hard because this might change who I am and my image. So I'm not going to really work too hard over here. And then doubly, if I worked hard and I couldn't get there, that'd be really bad for my image and who I am. So I'm going to stop, right? But a growth mindset is in a spot where it says, I want to get better. It's going to be difficult because in order to get better, I have to have my heart open to correction, to instruction, to teaching, to listening. That's why I have joked about 
a spouse who's able to do that, a friend who's able to do that, God's word, first and foremost, that's able to do that, to open our heart up, to open our spirit up, to see that, so we all come to start to see that I need to change in this area. I want to change in this area. It's not easy. It's not easy, but we're called to do that. I said at the start of the sermon, we would all say and sign on the dotted line that we need to grow as Christians, right? 101, that's what we're signed up to do. And I hope this afternoon, I've just given you a couple of things to think about. How do we always grow? How do we make sure we're always in a mindset where we say we want to grow? Because I said sometimes as we're walking up that mountain, sometimes it's easy to stop and say, I like it over here, right? I want to rest. We all feel that way sometimes, right? I like this view. This is good enough, right? I want to stop. I just want to be here for a while. I want things, right? We heard about it in the announcements, this world around us, how difficult it is. I just want, can I stop here? And we can, right? But we want to be able to always have the mindset that where we need to change, where we need to push through, where we need to keep going, we want to be open to that. And we want to have grace with ourselves. I see grace right here. We want to have that grace that allows us to understand that it's a process. It is a process that God has given us. And tomorrow again, we wake up and we have an opportunity to try it again. And what today's failure was, and we didn't get it right, doesn't have to define us. It doesn't have to define us, right? And as we have that mindset, and we will start to understand that we're all together trying to become in the best way we have possible through God's spirit, through his word that convicts us, right? An ability to really fulfill Ephesians 4, 15, where it says together in unity, in love, we all grow up. We all grow. We all get to that end point that was designed for us, that we grow into the fullness that is defined in Christ.